Philippians chapter number 2. Begin reading verse number 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. We just sang about that. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, for those of you that are students of your Bible, you know that the church at Philippi was started out of the home of the Philippian jailer that the Apostle Paul led to the Lord. And after him and Silas were in chains and at midnight, they prayed and started singing unto God. And then God sent an earthquake, opened up all the jail cells. Right? The Bible says that that Philippian jailer got saved, he and his whole house, and he took the Apostle Paul and Silas, took them to his home, dressed their wounds, and then I imagine that while all that was going on, they had themselves a good case of the can't help it, and was worshiping a little bit at the Philippian jailer's house. Now, after that point, between then and when the book of Philippians was written, that Philippian jailer and his family went out and they started winning other people to the Lord. And eventually there's a church. Then the Apostle Paul writes this letter to that church. Now, in verse number five, before we get to there, verses one through four, he talks about the church being of, verse number two, he says, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Right? That's unity. And he says in verse number two, at the very beginning, he says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded. That there is nothing that delights the Father, our Heavenly Father, more than when the church dwells together in unity, being like minded. But then he goes on to say, Not just like minded, he says, having the same love. Right? You've got to be like hearted as a church. It's not enough to have the same mind, you've got to have the same heart. Okay, because there's a disconnect between your head and your heart. Your head, the Bible talks about, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Right? It's two different things. Your head, that's where you use logic. Right? That's where you reason among things. We can all decide that it's the same goal that we're going after. Right? We all individually sit down and say, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. But there's a difference between deciding that something's the right thing to do and then making it a part of your heart. That's where it becomes a burden. Your heart is the seed of emotion, the Bible teaches us. When you become passionate about what it is you've decided to do, that's when rubber meets the road. Right? We can ask everybody in here today, well, hey, would, can you all agree that it's a good idea that we all set back a little bit more personally? Like, it'd be a good financial decision for you to save a little bit more money than what you're saving right now. We'd all say yes, but then half of us go out there and spend it all anyway. Right? Knowing or deciding to do something and then making it a part of your heart, meaning you become passionate about it, right? two different things. But he says, let this, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. That is the unity I can decide that I want to do something. You can decide that you want to do the same thing, but that doesn't automatically mean that we're going to be in unity on it. Okay, there have been many a times, I know that y'all don't believe this, but there have been many a times when, let's say, something heavy or something oddly shaped has to go from one floor of the house to another, and our father calls over Jordan and Christian to move it for him. Okay, And in the midst of that, I, in my head, all right, I know how this is going to work. Okay, This is the best way to do it. Okay, we all agree that whatever it is needs to get down the steps. right? And we're all resolved to get it down the steps. Okay, The best way to get it down the steps would be to open a window and chuck it out, but that's not an option. Okay, But then we start to move this thing, and then I look at it, and I'm like, eh, that's not going to work. And it, without fail, Christian just says, all right, you guys decide what you He don't want to be involved in it no more. And then, that, no, no, it's going to work this way. I'm like, it's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? That's too big to go through there. No, if we twist it this way and we do it that way, it's not going to work. 
And then I have to go ahead and follow through with the idea that he came up with until he realizes it's not going to work. And then Christian says, I think we should do it Jordan's way. And then we finally do it my way. Okay. And then most of the time that doesn't work either. And then we got to come up with a third plan. Right. But just because you all got the same goal and you're all purpose to do the same thing doesn't mean that you're in unity. Okay. Why do you think that the Lord set up the local church? the way that he did he being our high priest the great shepherd the one who bought the church paid for it with his own blood who's in charge of the church God's in charge of the church but then he gives us an under shepherd what's the under shepherd's job to follow after God and to take the people of God with him to see that they follow after what God has instructed him to do and then what are we all supposed to do we're supposed to link up arm in arm heart and heart and we're supposed to follow after God it's not a very confusing process Jesus said that he fitly framed us together that means that he put us together so good that from the outside in the world would think that there's no other place that we would belong we just fit so well there's no other place that we could be right? once you put all the pieces of a puzzle together you realize those pieces were meant to be together that if you take them apart, they don't belong anywhere else. But when God made us a part of this church, guess what? In the eyes of God, that meant we don't belong. Any, there's no other place that we would fit because he put us here. Until, like that church covenant says over there, that in the event that we believe that the Holy Ghost is leading us to a different church, right? we get gone from here because we realize that if God made us fitly framed apart somewhere else, then all we're going to do is be a hindrance around here. We want to get to where God fitly framed us together. Well, because that's where we belong. Well, once you're where you belong, you know why God fitly framed you there? So that you would be of one mind, one heart, and in one accord. Because He puts you there because you have the ability to be of one mind, one heart, and one accord. God wouldn't put you in a church that you couldn't be a part of. Now, you might put you in a church that you can't be, but that's a different story. If God puts you there, you're fully able to be in one heart, one mind, and one accord with the other members. Now, that doesn't mean that all the other members are going to decide to do what you're going to do in being unified in mind, heart, and in will. Okay? But it doesn't change the fact that God told me to be of one mind, one heart, and one accord. I can't base that standard based off of what other people are doing the Bible doesn't say that I'm supposed to have the same heart in me that's in Brother Mike Jackson because Brother Mike I don't think you're going to be offended if I say this there are times that Brother Mike Jackson is not perfect okay Lisa is shocked right but there are times that I'm not perfect there are times that you aren't perfect Right? We are not to become unified with one another in the flesh. We're supposed to become unified after the Spirit, capital S. Right? The Holy Ghost is to lead and guide us into all truth. So what's my heart supposed to be unified? My heart's supposed to be unified with God. My mind's supposed to be unified with God. Right? My accord is supposed to be in one accord with the Spirit of God so that I'm in perfect fellowship with the Father and the Son. And when it says, let the church be like-minded, have the same love, to be unified, to be in one accord, what it's talking about is, let us all agree that we're going to get hooked up with God the way that we're supposed to be hooked up with God. And if I'm unified with God, I'm going to be unified with you as long as you're unified with God. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right? He's going to enable you, right? set you free to where you can be unified with Him in spirit, in thought, in will. Because that's what He desired for you. So when the Apostle Paul says in verse number 2, fulfill ye my joy, you know why? He'd, it, would be, it would make the Apostle Paul's year. Right? His soul would be doing backflips deep down inside of here. If he found out that the church 
was dwelling in one accord, that they had the same mind, that they had to... You know why that would make him so happy? Because it means they're smack dab in the perfect will of God individually. And because individually they're in the perfect will of God, the whole church would be in the perfect will of God. And if that were the case, there ain't no telling what that church could do. Because if they're all unified, doing the same thing that God has put a burden in their heart for them to do, and they're all pulling together, right? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. They're going to go out and they're going to tear this world upside down, like we heard about on Wednesday night. Right? Instead of being divided amongst themselves, there's no conflict in here. If there's no conflict in here, right? The world cannot stop the church. You know who the church's biggest enemy is? The church. Why do you think that the devil tries and strives so hard to drive a wedge between members of the church or to cause divisions or to cause bickerings or you know, bitterness or greed or envy? Why do you think he tries so hard to get those things inside of the local church? Because if the church is unified, there's nothing he can do to touch it. If they're lined up with God, there's nothing that the devil, the world, or anything above earth, in the earth, or under the earth can stop a church that is perfectly unified trying to go after what God has given up a burden to do for God's honor and glory. Because that's what God desires. If it's the will of God for you to do it, it may be hard to do it, but there's nothing that can stop you from doing it. He's going to empower you like we heard about on Wednesday night. Why did God send the Holy Ghost so that the people of God would be empowered to do the will of God? Which was what? The Great Commission. Yeah, well, don't know how we got off on all that, but back down to verse number 5. He tells us what kind of mind he was supposed to be in us. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul just said that it would fulfill his joy if the church had this mindset. Okay, well, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, if it's good enough for Christ, it's good enough for me. Right? If this was the mindset that Christ adopted as our example, well, what example was he? He was the perfect fulfillment of the Word of God. He filled every jot and tittle of what God said he was going to be and what he would do. So if he was able to accomplish that which I could not do with this mindset, what couldn't I do? I couldn't save myself. I couldn't cross that divide between me and God that was rent by sin. But he did it using this mindset. He did the thing that only God could do using this mindset. That's good enough for me. People buy books all the time of people that are successful, or people that are billionaires, or people that have managed to you know, be successful in this line of work or that line of work, and they buy a book talking about that person's mindset. Well, you got a book right here telling you about the mindset that was in Jesus. I don't care what book you buy talking about how somebody was successful with this mindset. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Right? You can read the book. If you're in that line of field, it may help you become successful. But I'm saying if you're willing to devote time on trying to adopt that person's mindset, why wouldn't you adopt the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ? He did something far more impressive than start a Fortune 500 company. Right? Or become a billionaire. Or become a successful, insert whatever career you're doing right here, right now. Right? We're impressed with the mindset of men, but a lot of people not impressed with the mindset that was in Christ Jesus. Okay, well, verse number six, he says, who, in the form of God, what's that? He was the son of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Meaning when he was robed in flesh, he was all God and all man. He didn't think that it was any robbery to the part of him that was God to be robed in the flesh like man. In other words, he saw that it wasn't beneath him to step down off of his throne in glory, enter into the womb of a virgin like we just sang about. Why? To stamp the image of himself in our heart instead of the image of Adam. To overcome our sin debt so that we could become like him. So if it wasn't beneath God 
to robe himself in flesh. Because Jesus didn't see that as robbing any of his godliness. He didn't lose any of his godliness when he robed himself in flesh. All he did was is he became more and that he could become our kinsman redeemer after the law. You know why he robed himself in flesh? For you, not for him. He didn't gain anything by robing himself in flesh. He didn't become more God. He didn't become less God. It was not robbery to him. He didn't lose anything. What did he do? He took on flesh so that you could become like him. And the Bible says that wasn't a robbery. That wasn't beneath him. But why did Jesus take on the form of a man? Because way back yonder, the Bible teaches us, before the foundation of the world, Jesus was slain, slain as God's perfect lamb before the world was ever created. Why did Jesus take on a robe of flesh? Because it's the will of God. So Jesus became the will of the Father, and when he did it, he didn't see it as robbing anything from him. Keep that in mind. Then verse number 7 says, But he made himself of no reputation. Jesus, King of kings and lords of lords, or Lord of lords, that right? Jesus, Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, made himself of no reputation. And what did our last verse say? He didn't consider that robbery. He didn't think that it changed anything about his godhood. Why? Because whether people praise him or not, he's still God. It didn't change who he was that he became of no reputation. In the eyes of God, guess who he was? He was the Son of God. In the eyes of man, even though man didn't know who he was, did it change the fact that he was the one in the beginning that our Bible teaches without him was nothing made? In fact, your Bible refers to him as the capital W Word. So when in Genesis chapter number 1 it says that in the beginning God said, let there be light, who do you think said it? The Word. The fact that he was robed in flesh and had no reputation didn't change the fact that he's the one that said, let there, and then it happened. Didn't change who he was. Didn't change his power. Didn't change his station in the eyes of God. It didn't change anything about him. Keep that in mind. Made himself with no reputation. Took on the form of a servant. This is the one that has seraphims flying around his throne from whenever the alpha of time started until the very end of time, guess what they're going to be saying? Holy, holy, holy. This is the one that has cherubims that protect the throne of God where not just anybody can walk up to Jesus. Why? Because he's something. Surely you would look at Jesus and say, that man deserves to serve no man. But yet he chose to. And in choosing to become a servant, it didn't change the fact that he was God. It didn't rob him of any of his godhood to take on the form of a servant or the role of a servant, the job of a servant. It says, And was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. We're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. The one who has all power, who has all knowledge, who is omnipresent, the one who, according to your Bible, knew you before he formed you in the belly. The one who, beyond our understanding, comprehension, or if everybody spent the whole rest of their life trying to figure out just one thing about him that he didn't tell us about himself, we wouldn't come up with anything. Because he's so above our understanding, the only reason we comprehend him is because he explained it to us. The only reason man knows who God is because God told man. Everything you know about God is because God told you about God. Yet he humbled himself. Not only did he humble himself to where we could understand him, he humbled himself unto death. The one who is life, who is altogether lovely. The one that Pilate, because it was true, said he found no fault in him. The one that could have called for angels not just to take him off of the cross, 
he wouldn't even have had to have angels to come and take him out. He could have just looked at the nails and said, get gone, and they'd have been gone. But this is the one that talked to the sea and said, peace be still, and it happened. You think he needed angels to take him off of that cross? No. All he had to do was step out behind that robe of flesh like he did on the Mount of Transfiguration, except do it for real, and then no man can see him and live. Everybody there that day had been dead. Why? Just because he revealed who he really was. But he humbled himself. And when he humbled himself, what does verse number 6 tell us? He did not think it was robbery to humble himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Right, if you had to give somebody the option of, well, would you rather die in sleep? Would you rather something happen in a split instance that you couldn't understand it and you'd be gone before whatever was happening was even done? Or would you want to die the most excruciating, painful, humiliating death that man has recorded? That's the death of the cross. He didn't just say that he would humble himself unto death where he would pass peacefully in his sleep or of a massive heart attack or a stroke. No, no, no. He signed up for the worst death possible. But yet he didn't think that it was robbery. Okay, well. Verse number 8, latter part it says, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now verse number 9 tells us, because he did all those things, God has highly exalted him. Right? He has a throne that's above every other throne. He gave him a name which was above every other name. And at that name, all names or all knees shall bow, all tongues shall confess that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Right? We can go over to Revelation and shout about what it, because of what he did, what we're going to get one day. Hallelujah. Right? But that's in the future. When? I don't know. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. But we know he's coming back. But until he comes back, according to what the Holy Ghost inspired the Apostle Paul to write. We're supposed to have that mindset in us that was in Jesus. The mindset that he had when he took on the form of a servant, when he was robed in flesh and fashioned as a man. Why? So that he could do for us what we could not do for ourselves. You realize that that mindset that Jesus had, right, spanned the distance from heaven to the womb of a virgin? Well, how far is that? Farther than I've ever had to go. You realize that that mindset that Jesus had in him crossed all the temptation that the devil threw at him throughout his entire ministry? Well, how much temptation was it? Well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he tried to kill him. So much so that he, his body was literally failing. It was hemorrhaging blood. Well, how much temptation was it? More than I've ever had to suffer. More than I've ever had to endure. He promised me that I, he wouldn't allow me to be tempted above what I'm able. Right? He didn't even say, you've got to experience so much of temptation. No, he said, I'm only going to, I'm going to cut it off right where you can handle it. Right? You realize that that mindset, that in three and a half years, Jesus in his earthly ministry did, according to the Apostle John, so much in just three and a half years that if all the works of Jesus were recorded that the earth would not be able to contain all the books that with that mindset by his own power the dead were raised back to life the lame were made whole those that had demons became clothed and in their right minds he did that all under his own power but what mindset did he use this mindset why did he use this mindset? Because he knew that we needed this mindset. So as our great high priest, that in fact I think it's this chapter, talks about that, yeah, talks about how Jesus being tempted in all points like we are, he was able to become our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek so that he could succor all that come unto him. In other words, he experienced everything he did for your benefit, not for his. He went through what you went through so that he could tell you, I've been exactly where you're at right now, and I know what you need. 
Why did Jesus become a servant, take on the form of a servant? Why did he humble himself? So that he could become everything that you needed him to be. He didn't need to experience temptation. He's God. Temptation's below him. It's impossible for God to sin. It's impossible for him to even entertain the idea of sinning. But yet, he experienced temptation. Why? For your benefit. And he didn't think that it was robbery. When he sat down and he weighed the equation, Jesus plus temptation still equaled God. It didn't make him less God. Jesus plus not having a place to lay his head. Most of the time he had a stone for a pillow. The one time we do find that he's sleeping in the ship with his head on a pillow is actually getting some rest. What happened? They come and they woke him up. The one that walked across the water and then Peter said, you know what, that might be the Lord. And the rest of them are saying, no, nah, it's a ghost. He says, Lord, if it be you. So he thought it was the Lord, but he wasn't sure. What did Jesus say? Come. What did Peter do? Peter walked on water out to Jesus until he took his eyes off. And then what? Immediately, he said, help. And what happened? The Lord was there and he picked him up. Then what happened? He walked back on the water to the boat. You know what mindset Jesus had that whole time? This mindset. Now why we keep talking, you hitting on that point, thought it not robbery. You ever had the thought in your head? You hear, you know what, that'd be a good thing to do, but if I did that, I'd be losing this. Well, what did Jesus lose? Jesus left the place that we all strive to go to. That's called heaven. He stepped out of a realm where everything is made for his honor and his glory. And he entered into a place that, according to Charles Spurgeon, the fact that Jesus, being robed in flesh, walking among a sin-cursed world, would have felt like you and me being naked, running through a briar patch. Just him being in a world cursed by sin. But he thought it not robbery. Now nah, that's not a problem. We'll do that. Then he humbled himself. He became obedient unto what? Death. The death of the cross. As he's laying there on the cross, because the Bible says that he laid himself down. All those other guys, they's fighting him, some chariots, tooth and nail, trying not to get nailed to the cross. Jesus laid himself down on the cross. Why? Because he was a lamb before the slaughter. He said not one word in all the praetorium when they beat him near unto death. Well, how do you know that they beat him near unto death? Because the Bible says that his visage was marred much more than a man. He didn't even look human when he was carrying his cross those two miles up the Via Della Rosa. But all the while, he's thinking, is it in robbery against... I'm still God. This is not beneath me. Why? Because Jesus understood it needed to be done for you to have any hope of eternal life instead of eternal damnation. You know why it wasn't robbery? Because Jesus did that and God gained something. He's still God whether or not you got saved. But when you got saved, you know what he received? Another son. Another child. Because we've received the adoption of sonship. You were born again, born into the family of God. God received that which sin stole from God, which was what fellowship with His creation. And God desired that more than He desired not having it. It wasn't robbery for Jesus to take on all that Jesus took on. No, it was gain. Because Jesus loved you more than He loved the pain of the cross, the suffering of the cross, the humiliation of the cross. The fact that he had to break fellowship with the Father, which had never happened before and will never happen since. But God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son so that you could become part of the family. But Jesus didn't think that was robbery. Why does Paul want us to have that mindset? In the eyes of God, you're something. Don't let this world tell you that you're a nobody. In the eyes of God, you're the same as the Son. You're a joint heir to His throne. You were the very reason that Jesus bled and died so that you could be bought with a price that you couldn't pay. God thinks a whole lot of you, 
Because according to your Bible, if only one would have come to Jesus, because he's no respecter of persons, he'd have done the exact same thing if you were the only person that ever believed on him. Jesus thinks a whole lot of you. So much so that he said that if he goes to prepare a place for you, he will come again and receive you unto himself. Well, what kind of place is he going to prepare for you? Well, I've read the back, and John didn't really have the words to describe it. He's doing his best based off of what he's got down here on earth to compare it to. And he's saying, there are 12 foundations of that city. And each one of them foundations is nothing solid but a precious gem. He's saying each one of them gates is an entire pearl carved out to make it into a gate. And he starts talking about how the streets, he says, down here gold means a whole lot. Up there God uses gold as blacktop. And he says, but as beautiful as that city is, that's nothing compared to what's in the middle of that city. It's him. Do you know why? The God, I honestly believe this. You go and study all them things that heaven's made out of and pure gold as glass. You know why God used all them materials so that wherever you are in heaven, you can turn and guess what? If it's gold, you can see through. Guess what? You can look through emeralds and rubies and diamonds and everything wherever you are in heaven you can turn and look at Jesus that's why that city was built with the materials that it was built with so that wherever you are you got a good look at him God went to go prepare that for you and promised to come back and get you when it was ready for you God thinks real highly of you but every now and then this old flesh is liable to rear up and to say, you know what, that's beneath me. I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do it. Somebody else can do that. Jesus took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself unto death. Anybody God ask you to die this week? Didn't think so. Anybody in here this week God ask you to sell everything that you own, give it unto the poor, take up your cross and follow him? I didn't think so because I saw that y'all drove in on cars. That means you didn't sell everything you owned. Anybody in here this week, God asked you to forsake your family, to go out to a mission field somewhere, never to be heard from again, just following around, living off the goodness of God until God comes back and gets you? Even if he did, guess what? You shouldn't consider it robbery. You know why Jesus didn't think he was being robbed of anything? Because in God's eyes, his status stayed the exact same. Everything that he was going through didn't change the fact that he was God. He was 100% man and 100% God at the same time, but he's still 100% God. You realize that whatever it is that God asks you to do, you're still 100% the child of God. You're still 100% an heir, joint heir to the throne of Jesus Christ. That means you own everything that Jesus owns in God's eyes. He doesn't even see you when he sees you. You're robed in the righteousness of Jesus. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. We may think it's beneath us, but God sees Christ. You realize that when God asks you to do something, he looks at his own son and is asking his own son to do it? See, God thought so much that he asked you, being robed in the righteousness of God, to do something for the honor and glory of God. Why would that be beneath you? You may lose earthly possessions. We just said Jesus most of the time didn't have a pillow to lay his head down. He didn't have a home that he called his own. He forsook all and followed after the will of the Father. He still paid taxes. Guess where he got the taxes from? He went out in the water, grabbed a fish, opened it up, and there's money inside of it to pay all their taxes. What he's saying, Brother George, nothing was beneath him. Why? Because it was for the honor and glory of God. Imagine if everybody in the church had the mindset that they were willing to become a servant, obedient unto anything. There are some people that are willing to serve to a point. Well, I'll serve if I can be the maitre d' and I'm calling all the shots. No, you don't get a table here tonight. Ha ha. There's some people that say, well, as long as everybody can see me doing it, I'll do it. 
Who saw Jesus when he went up on the mount? Well, when he went into the garden. He told Peter, James, and John, sit here, watch, pray. Days of sleeping. Who saw all them times that Jesus was off having angels minister unto him to strengthen his flesh so that he could be able to do the will of the Father? Who saw all the times that when his flesh was about ready to give out, he through the power of God said, nope, we got to go one more mile. Because he looked through the prism of time and he saw you without a Savior and he saw that you needed one and he decided to do it anyway. When they cried, crucify him, crucify him, he could have said, y'all don't deserve me. But nope, he wasn't looking at them. In fact, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't see it as robbery because the will of God was being accomplished. Now, I understand that it's easy to you know, stand up here and say, or it's easy today for any of us to sit here and say, well, yeah, it'd be worth losing anything as long as God got glory for it until you got to go through it. I want you to look with me again, verse number 8. It says, being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself. That's that first part that we talked about, nothing being beneath you. You humble yourself. You say, Lord, it's an honor to do anything for you. Right? But then it says, and became obedient. We think obedience is a one-time choice. Either you choose to do it or you choose not to do it. That's not obedience. That's a decision. Before you make decision, the decision to do what God told you to do, you had to prepare yourself before then to do what God wanted you to do. Obedience is not a choice. Obedience is a lifestyle. If you think that you can obey God one second and then disobey God the next and still, you know, or disobey, but because you obeyed over here, that that evens out the balance of, no man cannot serve two masters he'll love one and hate the other you cannot obey and disobey and still think that because you obeyed you're good with God it's either all obedience or it's all disobedience what did the man of God tell the king Saul when he went down he told God says go down there and kill the king all the people women children all the animals nothing left standing well, he obeyed in part, but he disobeyed, disobeyed completely. He followed part of what God said, but because he didn't follow all of what God said, he was disobedient. And on that day, that decision is what cost him his kingship over Israel. You say, well, he did part of what God wanted him to do, which is all disobedience. Jesus became obedient. You know what that means? Everything he did was obedience. You know how to obey God in your life? Everything you do has to be obedient. Obedience is not a choice. It's you becoming the will of God. Obedience is not going out and saying, well, okay, God, because you asked me to do it, I'll go over here and do it. Obedience is doing it whether God asks you to do it or not because you know it's what God expects. Obedience is submitting to the will of God, but then doing it. You know what the will of God is for you today? To have that mindset in you. Because if you've got that mindset to where you will become obedience itself, whatever it is, whether God says to do it or not to do it, if you know what the will of God is, you're going to do it. You know why God wants you to have that mindset today? Because that's the only kind of servant that He can use. Apostle Paul wrote that it was his desire that every man would know how to, one, be a vessel of honor, but to possess their vessel in honor unto God. It's one thing to be what God wants you to be. It's another thing to know how God wants you to be used. The shiniest vessel in the world sitting on a shelf is useless. Didn't say that it was valueless. I said it was useless. There's a whole bunch of things in museums today that are cups made out of gold and they got precious gems on them and everything else. But guess what? They're useless because they're behind the glass. 
Can't use them to drink out of, pour water out of. Can't use it to cook anything on. Why? Because it's been set up over there on the shelf. You know what God wants us to be? Vessels of honor that are bring glory unto Him. But we're also vessels to be used. Being what God wants you to be has no point unless you're used to do what God wants you to do. Humbling yourself is saying, Lord, put me on the potter's wheel. Make me into what you want me to be. Obedience is saying, Lord, now that you've made me, use me. Jesus just didn't become everything that we needed to be in a Savior. He became obedient so that he was our Savior. He was all God, but even God had to become obedient. What's that mean? Jesus had to do the will of the Father. He had to fulfill it. He had to make it open, known, that He was the Son of God because of the things He did. Now, doing all those things didn't make Him any more God. He was already God. He was just revealing unto man because of the prophecies that God had said beforehand. He fulfilled everything that God said He would. You know how He did that? He had to become obedient to do it. Every day He chose to do that, but long before He made the decision to do it, He became obedient. It wasn't just, make me in the fashion of a man, and He went and did no, every, His whole life, those 33 and a half years, everything He did was to become obedient unto the Father. Those 30 years before he started his ministry, guess what you would guess what he was doing? He was being obedient. Why? Because he became obedient. Everything he did was obedient. Everything he said was the perfect will of God. Every step he took was because God ordained it. He was obedient. Now I'm not, you know, completely unrealistic. We're robed in flesh still. I know daily we fail. But to become obedient means, Lord, I want to get it made right. Because I'd rather be obedient unto you than to stay out of the will of God because I, was, I failed you today. Did he not say confess? You said he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. You know what that means? Doesn't just forgive it, he cleanses it. That means he took it away. That means God don't see it anymore. If you get it under the blood, God forgets it. It's as if it never happened. So why do you keep beating yourself up on all the times that you didn't do? That doesn't change the fact that you can become obedient today. When you bring it up to God, well, Lord, I'm sorry that I failed you yesterday. He's saying, what are you talking about? If he forgave it, it's gone. Because when God forgives, he gets rid, he cleanses it. That's why I got a real problem when somebody gets saved and then other people want to talk about what they used to do. It's gone. Not according to me, according to God. If God don't remember it, why do you? Well, in your own life, how come you're beating yourself up on why you can't do today what God wants you to do because of what you did yesterday? If you got it under the blood, it's gone. There's nothing between you and God keeping you from being obedient other than yourself. Because in your heart you have a desire to do what God wants you, but you don't have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. A servant doesn't question when the Father says go or do. Because the servant knows he's supposed to do what the Master says. He's humbled himself to where he doesn't have a will anymore. My will is what the Master says. My will is what God desires. It doesn't matter what I think about it. If He says it, I'm going to do it. That's the humility part. What's the mindset? That when He says, I'm going to do it. Doesn't matter what the servant did before he got to the master's house. If he's in the master's house, the master done cleaned him up, put a robe on him, gave him a place to live, a place to call his own, He's no longer out there. The servant's part of the family. God doesn't see you as a servant. He wants you to have the mindset of a servant that nothing is beneath you, but God never called you a servant. 
God called you family. And when you realize that because you're robed in the righteousness of God, God's not asking you to do it because it's below Him. No, God's asking His Son to do it. That means that if He asked it to me, robed in the righteousness of God, He's asking it to Jesus. God's not asking you to do it because He doesn't want it. He's asking you to do it because you're part of the family and He wants you to get in on what He's doing. If you've got the mindset that nothing's below you, then you start to realize how highly God really does think of you. Because God can only use a faithful servant. When you become obedient, that's when you start realizing it's not about what I may not be able to do or where I've got to go in the place that I have to leave. It, that don't matter anymore because I'm involved in the Father's business. This is something bigger than me. He could have asked Jesus, the Son, to do it, but He asked me, His Son, to do it. What an honor. What a privilege. That He'd even regard me in His very thoughts after what Jesus had to do in order to redeem me. All the pain and suffering that Christ went through, but yet God doesn't hold it against me. Why? Because He forgave it. It's gone. Not as far from the east, from the west, not a, you know, behind his back. No, no, no. Gone. As if it never happened. That's what justified means. Justified means it's been made right and all records been deleted. You go and start looking for the debt that was there originally, it's gone. But I could have swore that he owed us money once. Well, it's not on the books no more. It's gone. So when God asks you to do it, in the eyes of God, he's asking his child to do it. You know what the father asks his children to do? Only important things. You know what servants get to do? Servants do the menial task. Things that are beneath the family. God didn't call you a servant. He called you a child. He called you part of the family. You know why you ought to have the mindset of a servant? Because when I go out there, it's not about me, it's about the father. I'm on the Father's business. It's to bring honor and glory unto the Father. I'll make myself of no reputation, and that's not a problem, because my status with God, that hadn't changed. I'm still His child, just like Jesus when He was robed in flesh, was still the Son of God. Even though Jesus was being nailed to a cross, He knew that His status hadn't changed. He's still the Son of God. But it doesn't matter what you go through. Your status with God is still the same. Because you're not a servant, you're a child. Nothing can change that. In fact, God's going to make you part of the family three ways by the time it's all said and done. You're born into the family, you're adopted into the family, you're going to get married into the family at the marriage feast. God signed off on it three times. And once you receive the adoption of sonship under Jewish law, it's impossible for an adopted child to be disowned. God broke fellowship with his own son so that he couldn't break fellowship with you. Nothing that God asks you to do changes who you are in the eyes of God. So don't think it below you to do what God wants you to do. Become obedient. Because partial disobedience is whole disobedience. You realize that if Jesus, for just a half of a fraction of a second, would have not been obedient, your salvation wouldn't have any value because he wouldn't have been all that God desired him to be. He became obedient. He was obedience itself, manifest. What should we desire to be? Obedient. He didn't say, let this action be in you. He knew. We're still, the arm of flesh is going to fail me. Spirit's indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. But he said, let this mind be in you. That was the mindset that he had in order to become obedient. If you've got that mindset, it doesn't matter how many times you step in the mud, you're going to get out the mud and get cleaned up so that you can keep being obedient. You're going to keep pressing on. He said, let this mindset be in you, which was in Jesus. Nothing was beneath him. Because he knew that if he didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. Who's going to go out there and win the world from the world? Nobody got to be us we got to go down into the miry clay 
we got to get out there in the highways and the hedges we got to go seeking to save that which was lost you know what was lost or you know what lost means you can't find it it's going to take some looking and directing from the Holy Ghost because you don't know where lost is God does he knows right where they're at and he knows right what you need to do to get there you know what stops it from happening obedience we're not obedient we're not going to go and if we don't go we don't lose anything one way or the other I lose those gold, silver, and precious gems that one of these days I'm going to be able to cast before him and say, Lord, it was all for you. But my status doesn't change whether I do it or whether I don't do it. I'm a child of God. Doesn't mean I'm going to have fellowship with God. Doesn't mean that I'm in the will of God. But I'm a child of the king. It's for their gain. It's for God's honor and glory. It's not about me. I'm not obedient for my sake. I'm obedient for his sake. I'm obedient, uh, obedient for other people's sake. When you get that mindset in you, that's when obedience becomes more than a decision. It becomes a lifestyle. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.